B-A-M-O-C-R-A-T-I-C Everything you need to know about the Vigo Dem Party So sit back, relax, and watch from anywhere Get ready for a chat with a chair I'm Joe Etling, Chair of the Vigo County Democratic Central Committee, and welcome to the award-winning chat with the chair. Hope everybody's safe out there in our viewer world. We have got a tremendous show for you this evening. We've got a guest that everybody in this community, I believe, knows. And once you see who I'm talking about, you'll believe me. Tell our viewers who you are in case they don't know. My name is Chris Newton. And Judge Newton, uh, you are as known for all of your many great contributions to the community, as well as that distinctive bow tie. <laughs> so you've got, looks like red, white, and blue on today, tonight for, for us. For today, that's, that's correct, yeah. So if you could give our viewers a little bit about the history of the bow tie for Chris Newton. Well, I would always liked bow ties, um, but I didn't want to wear a snapper. You know, that just didn't seem to be good form. And um, my daughter Hillary uh, taught me how to tie them finally, and I just decided that uh, uh, I kind of liked that. I called it the professor look. Um, one time I was talking to Rick Shagley, my former law partner. And he said, what's with the bow ties? And I said, well, you know, it's like the law professor look. And he said, yeah, the law, the bad law professors wear those. So anyway, I don't know if that's the case, but you know, you don't if if you spill, and yes, I do spill. It's a lot easier to clean a shirt than it is to clean a, a silk tie. That so, is true. So it's how, just kind of out of the way. How long know? has it been that you have been sporting the bow tie? Well, um, I did have a couple snappers, I'll admit, you know, in the, in the past, but uh, probably a good. Uh, nine to ten, ten years now, maybe? That seems so much longer, Judge, than <laughs> that. But uh, I guess I'm curious. Now, there's there's a, a lawyer here or there that, that will sport the bow tie, but have you seen a trend picking up with the bow tie? Not really. I, I think some of the younger kids, you know, like them, but nobody wants to really learn how to tie them. Um, they're hard to get. Sometimes you ha have to get them online. It's hard to get them in stores. Usually at the stores they have the, I call them snappers, they're pre-tied ties. But, uh, but I, I prefer the ones that you tie yourself. Well, given that we have NES State University, of which you're a proud grad, That's great. Rose Holman Institute of Technology, St. Mary of the Woods College, Ivy Tech, all here in Vigo County, uh, how many professors do you see wearing the bow tie that you come in contact with? <laughs> I'm not really sure. It's been a while since I've seen uh, uh, any professor of any kind. Well, that's probably <laughs> true. Maybe we need to have a competition on each of these campuses to see who wears the bow tie. I mean, you'd be the hands-on winner well, in the legal I'd, community, I'd right? Be, I'd be happy to volunteer to be the judge. There's a good thing. You've done a lot of that. So <laughs> you'd be the hands-on winner in the Vigil County Bar. Of course, well, the competition the is the only contestant, <laughs> yeah. but beyond that, we, we would probably need to see on Indiana State's campus. So maybe we can we can draw that out and, and see a little competition. So um, we uh, had a guest a couple weeks ago that was really raving about you, Judge, and I didn't know how much you had to pay him to speak so wonderfully of you, but uh, Bernie McGee was a guest a couple weeks ago, Deputy McGee, and... Uh, of course, uh, we visited with him about that really devastating, serious injury that he oh. sustained. And of course, uh, we were both there uh, supporting a, a very worthwhile cause when that occurred. And uh, I was a little concerned he was going to find a way to blame me for it, but he didn't. Uh, but was m very quick to just praise you for all your support of him, and, and that's so gracious that you did that. Well, I mean, I was there. It was it was a fun evening up until that point. And at first, when he you know, he he was a little bit worried about getting hurt before it all happened, and uh, I just thought, oh, he's embellishing or whatever. And his uh, yeah, fiance wanted to go down and uh, you know write to him, and I said, no, 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 that's it's kind of bad for him. You got to give him his space for a little bit. And finally, when things kind of uh, calmed down a little bit, we both went down, and he was obviously hurt very badly. I mean, it was just a horrific injury when you think about it. Uh, 
telling, tearing that patellar tendon and, and maybe some of the other ligaments in there. And so it was just hard to see him hurting so bad. Um, you know, I've known Bernie since he was 12 years old, and he's been my um, oldest son, Elliot's best friend, since they were in sixth grade at, at Woodrow Wilson. And uh, he's been on, stayed at our home. Uh, Elliot's been at his home. Um, we, you know, just so many vacations and fun times together. Um, he was just always fun to be with, and he still is. Um, but I'm uh, just very, very proud of him. I told him once, um, that he reached the level of one of my children. And I know a lot of people say, oh, he's like my child. And I said, let me tell you what that means, Bernie. It says, no matter what you do the rest of your life, I'm always going to love you. But don't push me on that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so anyway, he's just been a lot of fun. Well, you bring up your children. Of course, we, we were graced with one of your daughters to speak to us, and we tried to take a few shots at you during her <laughs> chat with the chair, but uh, oh, yeah. give our viewers a little update about your family, if you don't mind. Well, my oldest son, Elliot, is a uh, captain in the Army. Uh, sometime this year, he's going to qualify for major. Um, I, you know, Got to be proud of that. Very proud of it, and uh, his, his wife is just uh, outstanding, outstanding mother and cook, and uh, they have three children. They're a lot of fun. Elliot's a, a polyglot. He speaks many languages and uh, fluently. And uh, his, uh, he speaks Russian very well. And so all of his children, um, they're all homegrown, but they all have Russian names. Uh, Ivan, uh, Nikolai, which we call him Nico, and Mila. And uh, they're just a lot of fun. We had a great time at Christmas. Uh, he was a, a tank commander and uh, he had uh, 14 of the M1A2 Abrams tanks under him. And so for Christmas, Pop Pop, which I was dubbed by the oldest grandchild, Ivan, uh, Pop Pop had to get him a, a, a tank, you know, with the store that has a working kind of cannon and machine, well, not working machine guns, but you know, <laughs> like a Nerf, uh, a Nerf, Nerf gun on it. And it's just so much, they had so much fun at Christmas. You That's know, awesome. With that. Um, Haley was here, you know, a few weeks back, yes. and uh, she has a daughter, Hayden, and she's just so much fun and adorable. Um, Hillary is an attorney, and her husband, Luke, is in the Air Force. He, recently, this, this past year, made captain, and he's now flight commander of a C-5 Galaxy, which is the largest plane in our Air Force, and they're based out of Dover, Delaware. Uh, he is going to... Um, he, he is going to deploy for a while, and so when that happens, Hillary comes home with their two children, Newton, which we call him Nudie, and Wren, uh, which we call her Rennie. Um, Wren, you know, is a, is a noisy little bird. That's what she's named after, and she is a noisy little bird sometimes, but just, just delightful. And then Ian, um, Ian, our youngest son, and his wife, Michaela, uh, they're both teachers at Terre Haute South Eagle High School, which is all of our alma mater. And, uh, and um, they have a little girl, uh, Samus. She, we call her Sammy. Sometimes she calls herself Sammy. She just turned two in, in November. And two days ago, she just had a little sister named Scotty. Wow. And it's S-K-A-D-I. And I, have, I showed you the cutest video yes, ever, you know? Absolutely. So ask me later and I'll show you the video. I'm one of those kind of grandpas. Well, you've got some delightful and adorable grandchildren, to say the least. They are a lot of fun. They're, they're all blonde. You know, I don't know how that happened. Well, maybe because we all are. Now, I know how proud you are of, uh, of your family that's in the military, but I, I know that you've got to also have some concerns about their safety all the time. Yeah, uh, you know, that's always a concern, I'm, but I'm concerned about their safety, whether they're in the military or not. You know, every day when I, when I pray, I pray for their safety and well-being um, of, of all of them. So, so yeah, their, their safety and, and well-being is always a concern of mine. And how about an update uh, with your lovely wife? Um, April is just uh, the most talented person I've ever known. Um, you know, you could look high and wide to, for all kinds of different things that she can do and you might be able to find somebody who could do each of those things better than her. It would be hard, but you could never find anybody that could do as many things as she does so well. 
Um, you know, we both had some bouts with uh, some health issues this past year, and hers was taken care of late in the year. We had a good report from her, uh, but it's hard for her to stay still for very long, and she's, you know, she's under doctor's orders to do that, and it's it's just hard because she's always uh, been a hard, hard worker and very goal-oriented, so. And you're both uh, very strong in your faith, to yeah. say the least, and, and many people uh, may not be quite as aware of your role with your faith and your religion, and maybe you share that with our viewers. Well, we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, you know, sometimes it's been called the Mormon Church. We prefer not to call it that now because I think one of the misconceptions, I mean, we believe in the Bible, we believe in, um, you know, the Book of Mormon too, and that's where the nickname came from, but many people are under the uh, just very, um, you know, big misperception that we're not Christian, and that's the name of the church. It's the Church of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, every prayer we offer, everything we do is in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, I've, we both had a myriad of uh, leadership responsibilities. Um, usually bishops serve for about five years, and I served for seven. I was in what's called the state presidency, which is over, um, you know, about nine different congregations in this part of the state. Um, and that took a lot of time, but it was always uh, really good, and getting to know people a little bit better and working with them. Um, um, my calling, or what I've done for the past uh, Oh, since uh, 20, let's see, I guess it was uh, October of 2020, is that I teach a class, we call it seminary. It's not seminary in the same sense that uh, other Christians have, have that, like, uh, uh, you know, for a college, but it's actually for high school students. And so we, in the past we'd had it at our home and had other teachers come. Uh, now we teach it either through Zoom or at church and every, um, morning that the kids are in school, the high school students. We have two congregations here. We meet in the same building, uh, just north of Union Hospital. Um, but anyway, every morning at 6.30, I teach a class that goes to 7.20. And uh, this year we're teaching Old Testament, so it's a lot of fun. So most of my church experience, though, has been working with youth, and that's what I prefer. I'd much rather work with young people than with the adults. You know, that's where you have the problems. It's with the it's with the kids are always great. Yeah, that's awesome. And I know that uh, you miss miss your dad every day, oh. and uh, he would be so proud of all the things that you and your family have been doing and accomplishing. Um, but uh, you're fortunate to still have the matriarch around and uh, know how close you are and how much you love your mother and I know that uh, every time she's at any event how much people particularly a lot of our viewers love to go speak with her but talk to our viewers about your mother well uh, she is just remarkable uh, she'll be 95 on March 11th and uh, she is just as sharp as ever uh, she remembers names she was always so good for my dad, everybody thought, oh, dad was so good at the names. Yeah, he was pretty good. But sometimes, you know, she might be walking along and say, hey, Nudie, now this is Joe Etling. And the last time you saw him was, you know, at the at the last uh, Democrat dinner. And uh, dad would say, hey, Joe, how you doing? Hey, you know, last time I saw you was at the Democrat dinner. And she would just sit back there and smile. And she's still kind of the same way. We. Uh, we met someone, or this was just a few years back, and it was one of my niece's good friends, and um, she remembered her name. Her name was Betsy, and said, "Oh, well, Betsy, and she says, oh, hi, Grandma, how are you? And she said, you've got a little girl too, don't you? And she said, yes, and, and Mom thought for just a moment and said, Genevieve. And she said, that's right, and we were all just stunned, you know, that she has such a memory, and we just, hope that, uh, number one, we all hope to live that long, but number two, you want to be healthy and you want to you want to be that sharp. You Absolutely. Know? I don't know if the, I'm that sharp right now, you know. <laughs> well, she keeps us on our toes and yeah. we sure appreciate her and we hope she's doing well and, and being safe as well. And of course, uh, all of this that surrounds the uh, virus that everybody's had to deal with, of course, that's complicated a lot of things for people. And, and I know that uh, 
course, you with regard to your role on the bench, how has that impacted what you're doing on a daily basis as a judge of the Superior Court? Well, um, in some ways, considerably. Uh, in some ways, I think that it's streamlined things and made things more efficient. You know, I'm, I'm older than you, I'm an older guy, and, and uh, it would be hard for me to practice law right now, but you know, we switch, the whole state's uh, switched from the paper system to online, and one of the things that took us a while to, to do, but, um, and I was concerned about, you know, the, the jail with it not being in close proximity to the courthouse of uh, the, the cost and the, you know, just the danger of transporting on so many levels from the jail to the courthouse and all the problems that could come from that. But one of the things that's happened is that we've, uh, we, we, ha we had to uh, move up our uh, use of Zoom. And uh, some judges were a little more adept to begin with. Uh, and some of us took a little bit longer to, to master. But it's just really been um, wonderful, you know, to, to deal with things. You know, there's something to be said about being in person and uh, being able to look at documents, and things like that. Sometimes it's hard, especially like with the small claim or, or another trial, um, uh, you know, really hard, you know, like with a divorce or, you know, um, other things. But, uh, you know, just to be able to look at documents and to be able to, to, to see all these things. But my staff's really good about sending those to me if I've been home and I've not done it from home for quite some time. Um, but, but um, you know, we're able to look at these things and make those decisions. And, and that, I think, has been a, a plus, uh, to have that uh, technology and to be able to, to meet via Zoom. Of course, there's not been many things we could take away that have been a positive of this whole COVID experience, but your point is well taken, Your Honor. And of course, you, you know, you probably uh, <clears throat> are a little more old school than some of the newer judges, but you've become getting, very adept at that. I'm getting better. <laughs> you've become very adept at that whole process. So that's really been, as you said, particularly in light of the jail being and, and maybe utilizing that for uh, remote uh, conferences or hearings with with people that are going to be housed at the facility that's got to be a plus for you moving forward it, it's just so much safer I mean we need to bring some people over as you're aware when we when we do take some plea agreements but um, you know just the, the 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 danger of transporting that many people to have that many people on the chain um, you know just uh, with the pandemic you know the the risk of people being ill um, just the, the risk that it is to a, a lot of the people who are observing, I mean, people can still observe court. Um, they can't record it, uh, but they can still observe. You know, we've had times where um, some, some bad cases, I say bad cases, I mean where bad things have happened and where we've had families fighting and it, it really turned into quite a ruckus, you know, here at the courthouse. And, and I think that when you can keep people away, you know, um, people still have strong feelings, but I think just on so many levels, it can be safer for people. And Judge, uh, seems like probably just yesterday that you took the bench, but how long now have you been on the bench of Superior Court? Well, not only am I now the oldest of the judges, I've also, uh, well, for quite some time, I guess I've served the longest, and so um, I'm, uh, for this year, uh, I'm the chief judge, which sounds kind of high and mighty, but what that means is I've got to, you know, deal with a lot of different things. I've got to, got to deal with uh, budgets and, uh, you know, other, other legal entities. I've got to deal with uh, uh, employment issues uh, overall. I've got to sign uh, many, many, many more documents. Uh, so uh, that, that's... <laughs> that's know, not that's your first hard, round on that. No, though. not my first round. No, I've done that, you know, several times. We kind of, we kind of share that joy, you know. But this just happened to be my year. Uh, but I'm also, as I said, the senior of the judges. So if somebody else was the chief judge and they weren't at the courthouse, then it would fall to me. If for some reason I wasn't here, then it would fall to the next judge, who would be after me as Judge uh, Lewis right now. But uh, so I've done this for a couple years longer than he has. But 
So this is um, starting my 18th year, and I'm running for uh, office again. I did file this past Friday, and so I'm hoping that uh, all the people will support me. Um, I, I will say that I, I ran in 1996 the first time and I lost. Um, then I ran again in 2004. It was a three-way race and I won. Uh, the last two times I've run unopposed, and I'm hoping to be unopposed this time because as I tell anybody that wants to run for any political office, I highly recommend running unopposed. <laughs> Absolutely. So, of course, you were and have been around politics and public service from your family from the time that you could walk around and, and uh, be holding a plate at a bean dinner, I'm certain. Um, of course, your view of being a judge and, and, and being in the judicial office, I assume, is one way. And I guess for our viewers, how has that played out over the course of your judicial career? Uh, well, I could go back even a little bit further. You know, um, I know when I was going to law school, I never imagined even being a judge. And it never dawned on me until I had the opportunity, some of the judges that were here, when I, um, uh, when I became an attorney, in 1999, when they would go on vacation, would ask if, you know, or, or taken off a day, would ask for me to fill in, and um, scared me to death. But I, I went in and had that opportunity, and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, you know, this is something that I could really like. You know, when you're going to law school, you know, all you think about is reading Court of Appeal and, and uh, Supreme Court opinions, and uh, not everything's like that. But I've just really enjoyed that part of the job. But I remember, you know, going to political activities for most of my life since, at least since I was eight years old. That was when my dad um, first was appointed to the Vigo County Council. And um, I remember later mom saying, well, those judges, the only time they ever come around, you know, is when they're running for office. And so when I was, uh, when I became a judge, I was like, mom, you know we're kind of limited with some of the things that we can do and we can't we can't attend everything there are just certain things that we can't attend so anyway I know a lot of people think that you know that we only come around when we're running but part of that is because ethically we can't attend everything that's an interesting point that you make there judge and, and I guess um, over the course of that time how would you say that things have changed politically from your experience, for instance, in those campaigns for your father to maybe how things are politically in this current climate? Well, um, I think one of the things, um, I think that still meeting with people, you know, is always best, you know, when you can meet with people and they can, they can see you, they can, you know, feel the hopefully the good vibes coming from you and convince them that, you know, you're the best candidate, you know, that's always great. But the problem is you can only reach out, you can only touch so many people. Um, and these are trying times because, number one, with the, you know, the pandemic, but also uh, with, um, you know, with the internet, with, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, Instagram, you know, whatever, there's so many ways uh, to reach larger groups of people um, and you know also with with TV you know you can still TV radio you can still reach out but now people have so many more options that it's hard to know exactly what your target group is and where where your best money and best effort is should be spent so that's 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 ever evolving of course, uh, you were around a lot of uh, the old school politicians over the years and yeah. a lot of good, uh, faithful public servants of our community. And, and uh, you know, many things are still on that level, so to speak, locally, but maybe nationally they're, they're not so much that way. If, if, if some of those people were still around today, what advice do you think they would have for people to maybe try to get people back on the right path? Well, um, there was a, a, an old uh, councilman who served, uh, my dad was they were on the county council together. Um, my dad was the auditor and the Vigo County Auditor is also um, by statute or, uh, you know, that he's or she is uh, the secretary of the council. 
And so I remember going to some meetings and, and watching my dad in action, and that was always great. And the person I'm talking about, though, is Charlie Fowdy, who he owned some, uh, I think he owned the Dairy Queen on, uh, on Wabash Avenue. He was a well-known uh, Big Ten referee, basketball referee, and a good friend of Bobby Knight's. But uh, he would chomp on a cigar, and he would, he, only he and my mother were the only person, people that have ever called me or could get away with calling me Chrissy. And he would say, now, Chrissy, let me tell you something. He goes, when your father and I served together, the word Democrat or Republican never came up. And, it, and his voice would just kind of crescendo. It would just get louder as he, as he would say it. And, you know, they just had a good working relationship. Dad uh, did with others. Um, you know, on the county council, and it was just, uh, it was a, a, a good time, you know, when people actually uh, got along, you know, that it didn't have to be so personal and so mean-spirited, and, um, you know, when somebody told you something, you could you could count on it, but it's, it's just too bad uh, that, uh, particularly nationally, but sometimes even locally, uh, you know, we hear some of these things, and a lot of it is because people can hide behind the internet. You know, they can say things um, somewhat, you know, um, um, anonymously or, um, you know, but they, it's just easy to hide behind a lot of the meanness. And that's, and that's just so unfortunate. So, uh, so different than the way I was raised. Yeah. You know, and, and so it's just, that's a little hard for me. So uh, people out there uh, that are, interested in politics and getting involved at precinct committee level or looking at running for uh, various county offices, what, what advice would you give them from your experience? Do it. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Um, come see the chairman. Uh, talk to other people of what the job entails. And, you know, it can be whatever you want it to be. You know, in the past, we had committee people who worked their rear ends off. I mean, they worked they worked so hard to get people to vote, to register people, uh, to make sure they showed up on election day. And um, you know, you could just, there were just certain precincts. You know, if that if that committee person was for you, you, you could just almost take that to the bank because they worked so hard. So I'm not. I, I don't think things will ever be quite like that. But I think that you know, if somebody jumps in, um, you know, you could get discouraged really quickly. But I think it's important, maybe not to reinvent the wheel, but to talk to people who've been involved in the past, see what's worked, and maybe you'll have some good ideas for all of us so that we can evolve and get better at what we do. I take it that you're glad the decision you made to pursue being the judge. Absolutely. I, I, this is my dream job. Um, I, I would have never imagined it until after I, as I said, after I started to we call it pro tem. It's uh, it's judge pro tempore. You know, kind of the kind of fill in for the other judges. They give you twenty five dollars a day. You know, I think it was the same back then as as it is today. Twenty five dollars to fill in for the judge. But it's such a great experience. You know, to see things from the, you know, from from that side. And so, particularly if if, if I have something, a lot of times I'll try to talk to some of the younger lawyers, and try to get them. And I'll just say, now look. It, you know, I want you to learn how to do this, but just don't run against me, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I think that it, it, it gives them a good experience and helps them to be better attorneys by seeing things from a different perspective. Judge, I also notice when you have uh, people observing your court, particularly law students or those who are intern or clerking, you always take extra time to explain to them a lot of the process. Why is that important? I, I think that... Um, a lot of times we take things for granted that we kind of have our own lingo like so many different groups and organizations and um, they're just different things that I think that if they go away from the experience and just think well, what just happened you know because you know we talk about further proceedings we talk about uh, affidavits for rule to show cause you know we talk about uh, IPCs which are initial probable cause hearings first appearance attorney all these different things uh, that we talk about and so after court I'll say do you have any questions and then try to try to teach them some things that will hopefully help them um, as they navigate through law school and as they become attorneys. 
That's great uh, that you're mentoring all those people. Now, as we've got embarked on 2022, Judge, what uh, thoughts do you have for our viewers about 2022? It's going to be better. Um, my wife and I have had a lot of health challenges. Um, so far, all of those things have been fixable, and uh, uh, we, you know, feel good about the, the, um, you know, the the healthcare, the professionals, all the things that have been uh, found out and hopefully fixed, and we're moving on. 2022 is going to be a better year all the way around um, for Terre Haute, for Vigo County, for Indiana, for this country, and hopefully for the world. Um, you know, we, um, we love living here. We are so grateful that we were able to raise our uh, children here. And um, now we've got uh, two of our children live here, and we're very grateful for that. And we're hoping the others will be able to move back someday too. So, well, Judge, you look great, you sound great, and of course we so appreciate yours and your entire family's contributions to this community. And again, I know how proud you were of all the things that your father and your mother have done as well. And, and uh, give your mother our best. And we so appreciate you coming in here and sharing with us and our viewership for the Chat with the Chair. And until our next Chat with the Chair, I'm Joe Etling. Thank you for joining us. Everybody stay healthy and you must make sure that you like us and you share us. I'm learning that, Judge, with this social media platform. So like us and share us. And until our next Chat with the Chair, I'm Joe Etling. Have a great night. I've always liked you, but I haven't been able to share you until <laughs> this time now that I'm running. See, I go. can do that now. That's Everything you need to know about the Vigo Dem Party. So sit back, relax, and watch from anywhere. Get ready for a chat with a chair.